Welcome fellow nature enthusiasts to the Electrifying Conservationist Assembly podcast. Join us in uniting with the planet's bravest wildlife defenders to raise awareness and ignite change for the survival of all our animal friends. Whether you're a seasoned conservationist or new to the animal kingdom, this podcast is where your inner animal fan can run wild. Today we're diving into the world of the Malayan tapir with our special guest, Diana Cobb. What's in store for you today? Well, get ready as Diana and I discuss everything about the only tapir species found outside of South and Central America. Let's welcome Diana to the Conservationist Assembly podcast. Diana, thank you for joining us on the podcast today. How's it going? I'm doing great, thanks. How are you? Yeah, really, really good. Thank you. I'm excited to uh, to have you here. Um, yeah, to talk about Malayan tapirs. Um, certainly, I think they're they're quite a visually striking animal, and, and I'm sure that we're going to learn about the the personality that that just captures the heart of everyone that has the opportunity to work with them. So, I guess first and foremost, can you tell us about Malayan tapirs? Yeah, so Malay tapirs are one of the four to five extant tapir species that we have, and they're the only ones that are not from America. So they um, they live in Southeast Asia. At the moment, you only have populations in Thailand, Myanmar, Malaysia, and Indonesia. There used to be more, and uh, there used to be a bigger distribution, but right now there's it's been, uh, it's quite small and the populations are small as well and very fragmented. Uh, they are the largest tapir species that we have and also have this distinct coloration, the saddle cloth shape. This is why in German, for example, we call them Schabracken tapir because Schabracke means saddle cloth, actually. And yeah, as all tapir species, they are so-called living fossils. So they have existed more or less exactly like they are now for millions of years. And they didn't really change much from their appearance, which is quite fun too. Yeah, that's really cool. And and I think it's, yeah, just down to how well designed they are. That Obviously, they, they haven't needed that change. And it's just so cool to think about like you say, they are the, you know, walking fossils and, and are so well designed that they haven't needed to, to change. So you've, you've, thank you for that, that introduction, first and foremost. It's, it's a great insight into to the Malayan tape here. And, and obviously a large part of why we're talking about them today is because they're not doing too well in the wild and, and you've started touching on, on their fragmented uh, populations. So, so what role do they play within their wider ecosystem? So it's not really clear what kind of ecological role they really play. So uh, if they really are seed dispersers, that's not really clear. But they do um, make a lot of changes within the habitat to all the uh, plants that they eat, their browsers. So um, they really like to nibble on all sorts of plants on their way and they also can really bend and push down uh, even bigger stems. So they are kind of the gardeners in their ecosystem. Um, but I'm not sure what their like real ecological role apart from this is. They are also, of course, um, a prey species for bigger predators. But since they're quite, quite large and can also be aggressive and are really, really quick to, um, to flee, they can also swim and dive very well. So they are also, I think, a, a difficult prey species for their predators as well. So what might those predators be? Because like I say, they are quite large. Um, so what, what animals might we find at least attempting to, to predate on a Malayan tapir? So um, I think it's mostly tigers that would prey on Malayan tapirs. Um, but there have been... Uh, I think doles could also sometimes be considered a predator species or leopards. Okay, uh, I suppose, yeah, yeah. If, if they've got juveniles around, there might be, right. yeah. yeah. And okay, yeah. Interesting to learn about what animals they might encounter in, in their um, habitat. So what are the classification or what is, yeah, what, what are Malayan tapirs classified as? 
Um, so they belong to the Perisodactyla, which are the um, uh, which are a group that consists of horses, rhinos, and tapirs, basically. So a lot of people, when they come to the zoo, they're, they're not really sure what the tapir is. They often think it's some kind of pig-related species. Um, yeah, but they're not. And as I said, there are four to five. We are not sure about this fifth species of tapir. It's not been really um, declared a, a proper species, but there are at least... Um, three other tapir species within the group of tapirs. So not only walking fossils, also quite unique then in the sense that they are, they're, yeah. they're from a, a small group of or a small family of animals when you consider hoof stock as a, as a larger clay or yeah, group of animals, but they only come from, from the family of horses and rhinos. They are quite unique then. Definitely, yeah. That's also, I mean, their look is quite unique with their proboscis which they can use like as a snorkel for example which is also quite fun and their um um how how they process their food is similar to horses so that's quite interesting on the veterinary side that they are they can be compared to horses in a lot of ways in their um feeding and also oh. sometimes in their behavior yeah. <laughs> right so then we know that they're not doing too well in the wild. What are some of the actions that zoos are doing to help give a better chance of survival for Malayan tapirs? Uh, so in Malayan tapirs, the, um, I have to admit that the zoos are a bit struggling at the moment. Uh, for example, IEP is struggling to, or in the process of finding a, an in-situ partner. Um, we're currently still working mainly on the ex situ population, so having this um, population as a reserve for um, yeah for later introductions maybe. But at the moment, um, there have been some action plans going on in the uh, in range countries, so they will try to reduce. Um, the destruction of the habitat, fragmentation. They try to work on how to avoid traffic accidents, which also happen quite often with Malayan tapirs, unfortunately. Um, and we will we are trying to find a partner in situ so that we can exchange expertise and also give financial aid to um, the population because we want to view uh, within the one plan approach. We'd like to view the the whole population, like the the ex situ and the in situ population together. So that's where we're currently at. So from the EEP standpoint, um, how many kind of Malayan tapirs are we, we looking at in European zoos? So what's interesting about the Malayan tapir EEP is that we're not only situated in Europe, but we also have two zoos in Asia, Singapore Zoo and Taipei Zoo which is great uh, because they have a lot of tapirs and they breed very well and they have, of course, great uh, environment for the tapirs. Um, the only problem is that the transfers between those regions are very difficult. And um, yeah, we're having a few problems now with the new European health law, uh, animal health law, to um, get this going because, of course, we want to transfer individuals and transfer genetics between the regions. But um, in any way, we have now in in the whole EEP population, we have 62 animals. Um, and in Europe, it's around 40. So that's great. Um, but we do want to go much higher with the numbers. So we, we would like to increase the population as far as we can. Perfect. And yeah, I'm sure hopefully with hard work and perseverance, um, that, that transition from or for mixing the genetics in, in Southeast Asia and, and the European bloodlines will, will happen um, and it will be better for everyone it, when it does. So aside from the EEP, what, what other work do zoos do or, or kind of help contribute to, to in, in Malayan tapir conservation? Um, so there's a project going on f that's managed by Copenhagen Zoo. They have this Southeast Asia um, program 
and so we're working very closely with them uh, to to get things in situ um, coordinated with the EEP. And of course, Malayan tapirs are also a great um, species for education and for research. So that's also something that we really focus on uh, for husbandry, but also for um, for the uh, reproduction. So as I said, it's very difficult right now to transfer animals between regions, but if you were able to do artificial insemination and be more have more expertise in that field, it would be much easier maybe to only transfer semen, for example. So that's also something that we'd have to look at also together with the with the uh, in situ population maybe and with uh, other zoo regions like the Asian zoos that are not uh, members of the EP um, but also husbandry for example enrichment studies have been done and um, yeah there's a lot of potential there as well. Fantastic. And yeah, it's certainly interesting to to hear about some of the things that maybe slip beneath the radar when you think about what zoos do, certainly research and, and all of these things that go on behind closed doors don't often get brought to light. Um, so thank you for, for telling us about that. So what's your favourite fact about Malayan tapirs? Uh, I think my favourite fact is, like I think many people uh, what something many people love about tapirs is that they have this habit of going into a trance when you stroke them and it's particularly funny to me because as we already mentioned they are 50 million years old so why do, do they do this we don't know <laughs> this but as soon as you stroke a tapir on its back or um, even like anywhere really some of them or many of them will just sink down, fall down, fall asleep. And you can really do anything with them. We did veterinary exams. You can draw blood. You can do ultrasounds. <laughs> you can do a lot. And they're just asleep and they love it. And I think that's very funny about this species. And they're, they're huge and they're also really dangerous. So they can really bite and, and hurt people if they don't want something done to them but they really like this stroking so whenever we talk about like medical training usually you would have to do conditioning and target training and stuff but with tapirs you really just have to pet them <laughs> and then you can do anything <laughs> if they let you so some may be a bit spooked but they it's, it's really it's really I don't know. I really like that about them. Yeah, and sounds ideal. And I'm certainly, I suppose, then when you're, you know, like you say, talking about doing it for veterinary purposes, like taking a blood draw, um, the results from that are going to be a lot more accurate because the animal wasn't stressed at the time. Yeah, and you can do it much more regularly. You don't have to anesthetize them or sedate them. It's it's healthy. You know, you, you don't, there are no risks to to the doing this and uh, it's also of course great for for the staff that works with them because it's just a nice interaction and uh, it's pleasurable for for the tapir it's not something that they they hate so um like many other medical procedures might be a bit um yeah, yeah uncomfortable sure but but those are just <laughs> those are just nice so yeah, yeah. i'm sure everyone's lining up to uh go and scratch a tape here because the vet's here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what was your first experience with Malayan tape here? Um, my first experience directly with the Malayan tape was probably when I started my job here. And um, I already knew that I was going to take over the EEP. So I was excited. I already really liked tapirs before I started, but this was also a um, <laughs> great, uh, great point for this job that I, I would be the EEP coordinator. And I remember that we had a late transport and we were receiving some fish from another zoo and um, we had to stay in the tapir house where we would slowly um, get them into the water and 
whenever we were waiting, we could just go up to our female Pinola who was standing there waiting to be scratched and then we could <laughs> scratch her and then go back to the fish and then go back to Pinola. And it was a really calm and nice evening <laughs> at the zoo. Yeah, she sounds lovely. So as soon as there's a keeper present, she's just there demanding attention. Yeah. So she was a single female. Now we currently have um, a pair and a small calf, oh, which fantastic. is wonderful. Yeah, she was um, so she was very, very used to being pet and touched and she loved it. But now it's a bit uh, they also are really well um, habituated to humans. But um, of course, it's a bit more dangerous when you have several animals. But you know, that was I, I don't think she ever she she was just calm and nice and <laughs> super fun yeah and so thank you for telling us a little bit about malayan tapirs um we're now going to just transition into to discussing your journey into to where you are in your career so yeah if you could just give us a bit of background on yourself and, and how you got to where you are now yeah so um i'm a biologist i work as a curator now in at Nuremberg Zoo. Um, I'm a general curator, so I am, yeah, I care about all, or care for all, all uh, our species, basically. Um, I started loving zoos when I was little, of course, and I already, when I was at school, I had this project that was already um, about a certain topic that we could choose. And I did um, mandrills at a zoo and their behavior. And that's where my passion kind of started. And then I studied biology. And then uh, in my master's, I um, went to university in Göttingen where I studied behavioral biology. And I was also able to do multiple subjects at the German Primate Center, which is, um, an institution that closely works with the University of Göttingen. And we did a lot of um, smaller projects and like uh, courses that involved primates. Um, we went to this uh, monkey mountain, it's called, no, uh, it's a, it's a walkthrough um, Barbary macaque exhibit in Germany. And we did some behavioral research there. And then I worked at the German Primate Center for my master thesis. And I looked at rhesus macaques. And um, this was really fun and interesting. And I thought, I always wanted to work with animals. But when you study biology, you realize that that's not really something that biologists do most of the time. They rather work in labs. And it's not this notion that people have, like yeah. what biologists really do. And then I thought maybe a zoo could be <laughs> something that makes sense. And I did an internship at Frankfurt Zoo. And I realized very quickly that this was the best job I could imagine. This was the, yeah, it was just so much fun and so many different things um, that you had to do. And that you could, yeah, your, your day was just different every day. And then I did another internship at Heidelberg Zoo and another internship at Landau Zoo. And then I just, uh, in the end, landed here in Nuremberg as a curator. And yeah, so I've been here for three years now. Feels like no time has passed. <laughs> <laughs> Feel like I just started, but uh, no, it's it's been amazing. And I, I love this job so much. I always... Um, tell everyone that this is the best job ever and most people believe me immediately because when I tell about my everyday work life they always look at me like oh you do this at work that's impressive that's yeah. great I wish I could do stuff like that at work yeah it does certainly when you work with animals it does certainly uh, get a lot of people's attention yeah so has there been, obviously, we know that you're the Malayan Tapir EP and, and you've always had a fondness for tapirs. Have there been any other particular individuals or species that, that you gained a particular attachment or a relationship with? Um, so, I mean, whenever you really spend more time with a certain species or individual, I feel like you start appreciating them more and become 
closer to them in every way. So I think every species that I've worked with here has been kind of special to me. But most recently, I've been um, interested in our reptiles uh, because we're changing the um, our collection plan and there's been a lot going on with different species and our blue tree monitors have really become my favorite at the moment because they are so amazing I don't know I could look at them all day and um, yeah <laughs> those are kind of my my precious animals at the moment that I show uh, very proudly to everyone who's visiting. And I was like, look at my tree monitors. Have you seen them? <laughs> yeah. And a lot of people, uh, zoo people always get it, but non-zoo people are a bit um, confused sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely hard uh, to get a good amount of people interested in, in certainly reptiles and amphibians and vertebrates but I think that attitude is changing slowly and, and certainly when they're a bright coloured like a, a monitor lizard it, it certainly does help draw draw people's attention to them um, and they're, they're quite active and they're quite cheeky mm -hmm. can't they monitor lizards be so uh, yeah I understand why you like them yeah so what is your favourite part of your role oh I think Oh, that's difficult. But um, I think that you are able to support projects from the very beginning to um, maybe not the end, but when I, when we start planning an enclosure and you know, okay, we have to look at every little detail that's going to go in there. And then that's finished. And then the first animals can come and you will have to organize what animals they are, how are we going to transport them. Then you bring them into the enclosure and they have to get to know the enclosure. Everything has to work out. They have to be um, socialized with each other, which can also be very interesting and um, exciting and difficult at times. And then when they reproduce and you have offspring, that's even greater. But if you can then um, do introductions, reintroductions to the wild, and you've seen this whole process of caring for them and reproducing and then sending them off um, to like a huge conservation role. That's really amazing. I think it's hard to find something that feels that great. And we do quite a lot of intro reintroductions in Nuremberg, especially in Europe. Um, and that's also, it's, it's just a great feeling. Yeah, I'll happily build on that. So what are, are some of those reintroduction pro or our species that you've reintroduced that you're, you're particularly proud of? Um, we regularly reintroduce, um, so what's the English name? <laughs> <laughs> so we regularly reintroduce uh, bearded vultures really? uh, in the Alps. Uh, we did some European pond turtles um which we also do regularly almost every year we have and regularly do reintroduce european ground squirrels to czech republic it's always fun um, um we also do uh, alpine alpine ibex regularly which is always beautiful because they go uh, uh, up into the mountains with a helicopter which is quite spectacular um and also just recently we we brought some of our northern bald ibis to spain great yes yeah, so thank you for highlighting some of those projects because it is it's really important to talk about them um so what surprised you most when you first started your career um what surprised me most maybe that um yeah, how long maybe everything really takes. You often hear about people that don't know a lot about zoos, like, uh, why don't you just reintroduce the species or these animals? Um, or, I don't know, <laughs> just build a new enclosure. And this really takes very, very long, all of it, especially if it has to have like a um, scientific... Um, support if it has to be scientifically um, connected and all those 
reintroduction projects have been going on for those that are really successful now been going on for many many years and people are there full time working on them so um you tend to underestimate how many people and how long stuff like this really takes and that it's not just wishful thinking and just doing it but um yeah there's a lot and it's also very expensive yeah yeah as much as we don't like to admit it um funding is is a huge part of of every industry but certainly you know this industry where where we rely on donations and and all of these projects and research like say yeah um isn't cheap yeah so what is some of the best advice you received from a mentor or colleague in this industry um i would say probably that <laughs> if you don't know something or you're not sure to just admit it because we have this great community of zoo people who all have incredible expertise and incredible knowledge of different things and they're always happy to share this knowledge so whenever you're not sure you're it, this can happen this we have a lot of species and nobody's an expert on all of them and especially for someone like me who hasn't worked in zoos for a very long time um i don't have a lot of experience with most of these animals so having colleagues and um other zoo people who have a lot of experience with those species is so valuable so you can always say well i don't know this but i know somebody who might know it and i can ask them and um this is very helpful and it um goes a long way i think everybody's always happy to uh help yeah i can agree with that um it's one of the the most motivating things about this industry is that, is that everyone is in it together like you say and and yeah the the network of zoos globally yeah. is is incredibly strong at the moment so with that that's given us a, a, a really nice insight into to your background and and how you go about your your role and um, so we're just going to finish off on the episode with some some light-hearted questions just to, to finish on a high so diana are there any dream species that you'd love to see in the wild i really like to see puffins in the wild <laughs> i've been to several cliffs looking for puffins and i never saw them and um that's something i'd really like to see it's not like I don't have to travel far to see puffins, but I, <laughs> I still haven't seen them. So that's great. I really would like to. And is there one country or continent that you'd love to spend an extended amount of time? Um, I have a lot of countries on on my list. Um, I think for a, for going there for a long longer uh, period of time i'd really like to see new zealand and i think it only makes sense if you go there for a few weeks or months because traveling there from germany i think germany yeah. is the furthest away from new zealand in the world <laughs> or something <laughs> i've heard so uh, yeah that's that would be great but i'd also love to see um some parts of southeast asia especially maybe malayan tapir habitats but there's still a lot that I haven't seen. <laughs> I'm sure you'll get there. If you could be an animal, what would it be and, and why? I think if I could be an animal, I'd probably be a bear. <laughs> I'd like to be a bear. I can imagine that it's if you have a nice habitat like Canada mm. <laughs> or Alaska, it, it might be quite nice being yeah, yeah. an uh, apex it. predator and having enough food and just being um being able to sleep a lot <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah i can yeah. appreciate that i think the life quality of some some bears is quite nice yeah they've, they've got it made they've certainly found a niche and, and uh, done very well with it so when you're not working diana how do you keep busy i really like spending time with my dog or with horses so also um, animal lover <laughs> in private uh, and I also like to draw and paint which is also can be combined with animals as well 
um, yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> basically the same hobbies as my job, <laughs> and I sometimes combine them to, um, you know, to, for for uh, projects at work. It sometimes makes sense. I've designed some um, some signage in zoos by drawing uh, like macaques or manga bees or something. Yeah, that's really yeah. cool. Um, and yeah, obviously, I suppose when art work with art, you you focus on on what inspires you and motivates you so then it's not surprising that, that a lot yeah. of your artwork would reflect reflect animals so that's really really great and, and last question for you diana uh, what is one thing you think our listeners should take away from today's episode um maybe that um conservation is a group effort and that a lot of people are involved in saving species and that it's important that all those people work together and that zoos have certain roles that they fulfill and then working together with with in situ conservation experts makes us all um yeah work together to save species so it's it's a big puzzle and everyone's one piece and everybody has different um different things they bring to the table so i think that's really important to keep in mind no, that's incredibly wise and uh yeah um there's always room for for everyone to to get involved so with that diana you have answered my last question for you in our conversation today so thank you so much for your time uh talking about these truly amazing species and, and some of the work that that goes on behind closed doors uh, we'll be sure to keep a close eye on everything that's happening in the world of malayan tapirs and, and the incredible work of zoos fighting for their survival yeah, thanks for having me. It was really fun. So I've got another poem for you to finish the episode on this week. Um, again, from uh, the book Two Steps Behind, which is a collection of poems uh, about rare and endangered species written and, and illustrated by Dawn Lawrence. And obviously fitting in with today's episode, we've got one on the tape here. So this is The Tape Here by Dawn Lawrence. I've got the body of a pig. I'm not a pig, of course. I look more like an anteater, but I'm closer to a horse. If the horse in prehistoric times had stayed where it should be, in the jungle where I am today, it might have looked like me. I'm related to the rhino, I think that you will find, with four toes on my front feet and three on those behind. A trunk is where my nose should be, a kind of rubbery hose, much smaller than an elephant's, but useful, I suppose. I use it when I sniff out food to reach the leaves of trees. I grab, then place them in my mouth and hope that I won't sneeze. I trot and gallop like a horse, we're cousins I've heard tell, but I can walk on riverbeds and feed down there as well. My swimming skills are excellent. It's water I love best. I'm either in or under it, except when I'm at rest. You might just catch me lazing if the sun is extra hot, but don't think that I'm lazy, that's one thing I am not. You've got no chance of catching me if I should choose to run. There might be races everywhere a tapir could have won. I'm such a curious sight to see, my front is coloured black, the rest of me, a ghostly white, is saddled on my back. That's why the moonlight suits me well, with shadows round each tree, so if a ghostly shape slips past, you'll never know it's me. And that brings this episode of the Conservation is a Symbol podcast to a close. I am your host, Johnny Blockson. As always, thank you so much to every one of you for tuning in. If you did enjoy this episode, please like, share and leave a review. It really helps get the word out, uh, helps us to keep making more content and and bring that awareness and education and and the stories of of our guests to the masses um, and always as i say there's plenty of opportunities for you to get involved with the podcast should you feel inclined to if you have any questions that you'd love to have asked on the episode to a guest or uh, a species that you'd love to see represented or you know, you've got pictures of Malayan tapirs that you'd love to feature on on the podcast social media. And then you can DM us on Instagram 
or email us uh, on conservationassemble at outlook.com and uh, yeah we'd love to, to hear from you um, but until next time um, thank you again for, for listening and, and I hope you will enjoy future episodes